I'm really excited to, to close out Micah today, not because, not because I'm ready to be done with Micah, but um, I love the ending of books because it, it, it's kind of like the ribbon tied and, and you put a bow on the conclusions that the author makes. And this prophecy from Micah is that time's really hard and really dark and really wrathful. And, um, and, and at the end of the book, what we see is there is a victory that's promised to God's people. He ends the book with hope, and it's, it's actually really encouraging to see. And so um, in Micah chapter 7, we'll cover verses 11 through 13, or I'm sorry, 11 through 20 today. And um, I've got three points for you. Um, in 11 through 13, we'll see that the remnant is prophesied to grow, that, that God's people, not just the ethnic or political nation of Israel, but the remnant is promised to grow. Uh, we'll see in uh, verses 14 through uh, 17 that the nations will fall. And then in verses 18 through 20, we'll see the, the faithfulness of God and we'll, we'll be assured that our God will remain. So let's jump into this. Uh, number one, the remnant will grow. The immediate context of Micah is important to understand. Um, if you've missed out on or you know, if you've forgotten where we are in Micah, uh, basically the first six and a half chapters are Micah promising that because of the sin of Israel, punishment is coming for them. He's prophesying in the 8th century BC. He's promising that because of their disobedience to God, God is going to allow both kingdoms of Israel to be conquered, overtaken, and exiled to another country. Uh, the northern kingdom is going to be conquered by, uh, by Assyria, in exile, the southern kingdom is going to, of Judah is going to be conquered by Babylon. This historically we know actually does happen. But then at the end, Micah promises that the remnant will expand, will, will be expansive and will grow. And so uh, what he's talking about is somewhat of a mystery, but we do know there's some sort of expansion happening. Um, Judah is, uh, my, my son, most of y'all know Judah, he's up here on Amen Corner. And uh, he was the last Basham um, that got adopted into our family. And when, when he was the last Basham to move into, and when he moved in, um, we had a, uh, a Ford Taurus X. I don't know if any of y'all remember those, like Ford quit making them. It was the best vehicle Ford ever made. It was like a Griswold station wagon. It was amazing. And, um, and it was, it seated six and we were becoming a family of seven. And so we get the call, Hey, we're sending a boy to your home. We're excited, but we're like, we don't even have a seat for this kid. And, um, the, the real kicker was I had uh, flights booked and a trip to Ukraine planned in like two or three days. And so I was getting ready to go to Ukraine. We had a new kid moving to the house. My wife just says, leave this home. You're not welcome back in this home until you come home with a minivan. And so I get in our, our little station wagon, Griswold, and I go like a madman to the dealerships. I was a car salesman's biggest dream. Like I walk in like with a panicked look. It's like, my wife won't let me come home unless I get a new van today. And, and they're like, this is great. Like they had been praying for God's favor and the Lord said, me there so they could get their commission. And so, um, so we joyfully did that. Welcome Judah to our family, but expansion causes, causes some change, doesn't it? I mean, we saw this in our church, like when our church was growing, we needed to buy a building, move into a building. We did that. We moved into this building. Now you can look around and see a lot of empty chairs because we had to uh, expand and multiply to two services. These are good things, but they make us uncomfortable. And here Micah is prophesying the expansion of God's people. And, and he's trying to lay their hope in the fact that it is a good thing when God expands his kingdom. But so often God's people don't view it as a good thing. Uh, we, we, we naturally tend to view ourselves in an exclusive way that we've got the, the hold on eternal life and we're, we're reluctant to let it go or invite others in because we're comfortable where we are. Well, Micah prophesies a day where God's kingdom will expand, and I believe even beyond the borders of Israel. Let's look at these verses, uh, these first three verses together, verses 11 through 13. Micah says, a day for the building of your walls. In that day, the boundary shall be far extended. In that day, they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt and from Egypt to the river, from sea to sea, from mountain to mountain. But the earth will be desolate because of its inhabitants for the fruit of their deeds. 
Now, we're going to get to some application of this to your own life. I know it's hard to say, well, how could this apply to my life, this weird text from uh, you know, 2,800 years ago? But, um, but I want to first deal with interpretation. So we're going to play a game. It's going to be uh, fun for me, probably not for y'all. It'll make some of y'all really uncomfortable. But um, I'm not going to make you participate or anything, just kind of in your mind. Um, I want to show five different interpretations of this text. And the reason I want to do this is it's going to prep us for Isaiah too. Sometimes biblical prophecies really hard to understand what God is saying and even how or if or when that prophecy has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled in the future. And so I want to go through five different ways that this has been interpreted. These are all legitimate interpretations. They're biblical. These aren't heresies. These are interpretations that uh, Bible scholars throughout church history have, have held to. Um, you may agree with some of them. You may disagree with some of them. But I want to kind of present these to you, and I want you to think through in your mind, what, what does this text actually mean? What's Micah talking about in the first three verses here? So the first one is a historical interpretation. And the, the guy that, that, uh, that presents this interpretation and holds to this interpretation says, yeah, it's so clear. You look at verse 11 that the historical interpretation just describes a return from exile. We don't need to add anything else to it. We don't take anything away from it. That's what's happening in the text. Verse 11 says there are walls being built. um, And and literally, if you keep reading the Bible, you learn in the history of Israel, uh, they are exiled. And in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we learn that that through God's sovereignty, he leads kings to not only let them go back to the land, but those nations pay for the rebuilding of, of the city and the rebuilding of the walls, that all of this actually comes to pass. And that's true. It does come to pass. And so the people that hold to this interpretation say, yeah, it's obvious. Don't, don't put anything else on it. But then here comes another guy, and he holds to a messianic interpretation. And he says, Micah 7, 11 through 13, describes the coming of Christ because context matters. It matters what Micah's uh, uh, driving point is, not just in chapter 7, but throughout the book. That as you look throughout the book, what is Micah's whole narrative and point? Uh, The person that holds to this interpretation would say, what about the breaker of chapter 2? Remember the cool biker nickname for Jesus in chapter 2? What about that guy? There's a, there's a prophesied shepherd that's going to come into Israel and then break the borders of Israel, the gate of the flock, and expand it. That's what this is talking about. And he would say it's a messianic story. The ruler in chapter 5 that's prophesied, Micah prophesies in chapter 5 that a ruler would be born in Bethlehem. That's clearly Jesus and his coming uh, to be victorious for his people. And then yet another guy comes along. I know it's sounding like a bad joke at this point, but the third guy comes along and he says, it's obvious uh, I hold to a futurist interpretation of Micah 7, 11 through 13. It's des- describing the millennial kingdom. You're, you're too short-sighted if you just look at it as the return from exile. The Bible ends in the book of Revelation. So that's where all of future prophecy takes us to. And so clearly this is taking us to the end of the Bible. We can look at verses 12 and 13. The nations come to Israel while the rest of the earth is desolate. This sounds like a literal place, they would argue. They come to Jerusalem and Christ rules physically from there after the second coming in the millennial kingdom on earth. Yet a fourth guy comes and he says, well, I hold to an allegorical interpretation. And I think that this passage describes a spiritual victory. And he would say, Israel is the church. Uh, The church is God's people of all times and all places. And he would use passages in the New Testament like Romans 9 to show that God has always been working among his people. And it's not just Jewish people, that it is a remnant from all nations. And this is actually prophesying that truth that people wouldn't flock to just a land. They would flock to a people. This is known as the church that they would say that this describes a spiritual victory over time that God would expand and expand and advance and advance his kingdom. And then we get to the fifth guy, which is his name's Will, by the way. And he's an idealist, and he would just come along and say, yep. And that's why I'm so easy to get along with, right? That's why so many of y'all love me so much. And Jeremy's not an idealist, and that's why he's so stubborn and argumentative all the time. Now, I, I did want to put my cards on the table. I am an idealist in a lot of cases, and this is one of those cases. I think this is a multifaceted prophecy. Um, And so I think I would just look at those four guys and be like, you're all right. Why can't we all just be friends? 
Um, but you can't always be an idealist. That would lead you to universalism. There are parts of the Bible that are clear and it doesn't allow for heresies. And, and it, the, you have to have the right for interpretations. There are some interpretations of this that wouldn't fit into an idealist interpretation. Um, but what I want to emphasize is, is that Micah is prophesying within a context. And he does have a messianic view in mind, although he may be talking about a literal millennial kingdom in the future or a literal return from the exile. He does have messianic implications in place that we learn from places like Micah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 5. Uh, if I could remind you of the illustration of, of God's Old Testament prophets being like men standing on a great mountain, receiving revelation from God. As they look out from the view of that mountaintop, they see other mountaintops. They can look into the distance and they can see mountain peak and mountain peak and mountain peak, but they can't necessarily see the valleys. That's not quite in view for them, nor do they really have an accurate way to gauge how much space there is between the mountain peaks. Uh, even Paul in the New Testament makes it abundantly clear. He says a couple of times that the Old Testament prophets prophesied and didn't fully understand what God was revealing in God the Son, Jesus Christ. And so they're prophesying, and there's truth there, but Micah didn't necessarily understand it all. He definitely didn't live to get to see fulfillment of it. Um, as, as we learned last week from Pastor Jeremy, they threw him off a cliff. And, and so what, what Micah may have had in mind is giving hope to the immediate generation that would be conquered and exiled. Uh, but the Holy Spirit, I think, had other things in mind, these other mountain peaks, like the incarnation of God the Son, Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, and the drawing in of all nations to Christ, and the second coming of Jesus that we long and await for, and the millennial kingdom of Jesus on earth. All of these things, I think, are in view as well. And Micah is actually using God's faithfulness in the past so that he can give hope that the people can trust God's grace in the future. And he uses this, and we know this is what he's getting at by mentioning Egypt. He's probably making reference in verse 12 to the Exodus, how God set his people free from Egypt. He's definitely referencing that in verse 15. In verse 15, he says, As in the days when you come out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. And so God's faithfulness to their fathers had been seen in past generations, and Micah's message is that God's faithfulness could still be trusted that there is an idealistic and revelatory way that God is showing his faithfulness and will continue to show his faithfulness into the future repetitively. His faithfulness is actually seen in increasing ways throughout redemptive history. How much more can we see his faithfulness after the coming of Jesus Christ? Matthew Henry um, uh, is an is a, uh, old pastor and theologian that I've shared a lot with. His commentaries have been helpful in the book of Micah. And on this passage, he writes in an idealistic way. He says, Their deliverance out of Babylon shall be a work of wonder and grace, not inferior to their deliverance out of Egypt. Nay, it shall eclipse the luster of that. Much more shall the work of redemption by Christ. Now note, God's former favors to his church are patterns of future favors and shall again be copied out as there is occasion. And so the interpretation may be vast and varied, but I think we can laser focus in on application. What does God want us to see in 2024 from this message given to his people in the 8th century B.C.? Well, as Henry concludes, God's former favors are patterns for future favors. And so an application we can have is if God has been faithful, and he has, formulaic, then we can conclude that God will be faithful. Have you seen God's favor in your life? I promise you, you have. I, I like hanging out with middle-aged guys because I'm not one and I'm denying that I am one. And it, it, it just reminds me of that truth that I like to lie to myself about. And as I hang out with these middle-aged guys, most of them are white. They, uh, they say things like living the dream, right? You heard that saying, like, how you doing? Living the dream, or another day, another dollar. And one of them is when you ask them how they're doing, they say, better than I deserve. Have you heard that one? Yeah, yeah man, I love it. And, and that truth is, is I actually just finished reading a book with a friend in the church here, and, and the author used that saying throughout the book that, that when people ask him how he is, he says, better than I deserve. And the reason that, that dudes say that is because they are better than they deserve. I promise that God has been better to you than you deserve. I, you know, and you might be at a place where it feels like that's not true. 
Maybe it feels like the whole world's crashing down, or maybe your circumstances are not pleasant or good or rewarding, and maybe it doesn't feel like that. Well, the Bible's answer is, is not to look into some kind of hopeful prosperity that might be just around the corner for you. The Bible's answer is instead of looking forward, that actually you look back. You look back and you say, has God ever abandoned you? Has God ever been faithless to you? Has God withheld favor from you? And the answer is no. You see, this prophecy is about the expansion of the remnant, that how God had delivered them from Egypt, he would deliver them from Babylon. And he would deliver them from Rome. And he would deliver them ultimately from sin. Romans 9 talks about the expansion of this remnant. As Paul writes, it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac your offspring shall be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. He continues in verse 27. Isaiah cries out, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. And so this nation goes on to, for the most part, the majority of them reject God. But somehow, Micah prophesies, even when the majority of their ethnicity and race is going to reject God, that the remnant is going to grow that the walls are going to increase, that the borders are going to get larger. How can that be possible? Well, it's because God draws people from all nations to his one spiritual nation that he calls a remnant. Verse 14 calls out to God, shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, who dwell alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land. Let them graze in Bashan. That's not Basham, that's Bashan. And Gilead is in the days of old. This is a reference to poetic places of great peace and, and prosperity and beauty and provision. This prayer is for the breaker to come and be the shepherd that will expand the remnant to the ends of the earth. And if that happens, if the, if the remnant will expand to the ends of the earth, then what inevitably will happen is all nations will fall to him. All nations will bow the knee to him. That's point two, that the nations will fall. The enemies of God will not last. Y'all ever caught a group of rowdy kids in the midst of rowdiness and sinfulness and crazy heathen behavior and how they all get quiet? Like they're just, and when they're caught red-handed, there's nothing they can say. I have a very traumatic childhood event that I, that I unload about from the pulpit from time to time about my sister Jamie breaking a lamp. And my mom came home and caught us and caught the lamp broken. And we were just silent. There was nothing we could say. I, I was embarrassed for Jamie. I was like, the hammer's getting ready to come down on her. And she opened her mouth and said, Will did it. I <laughs> never felt so betrayed in my life. I still haven't gotten over it. I talk about it in counseling all the time. It's just, it's just always on my heart. And she, to this day, she won't admit it. And I'm using my platform as a pastor to correct her. Y'all need to help me in this. My goal is to get her to confess to breaking that lamp. But just like kids that are caught doing rowdiness that they shouldn't be doing when, when mom gets home, God's enemies will be caught in their idolatry and their sinfulness on the day that Jesus returns to establish his kingdom. That... There will be nothing that they can say. Look at what verse 16 says about this. The nation shall see, the shepherd that's coming is the, is the inference here. The nation shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. You see, the Jews misunderstood passages like this. They looked at the condemnation of nations and they said, well, because I'm born Jewish, then I've, I've got everything and all the other nations be damned. It doesn't matter. I don't need to worry about the Gentiles. And it grew them into a very racist group. But you need to remember that God was revealing to them that he wasn't just condemning all nations. He was offering an invitation to people from all nations to join his nation before all nations would be defeated. You see, the remnant will come from all nations. At the end of the book in Revelation, it says that around the throne will be gathered people from all nations, tribes, and tongues singing praises to God. You see, the, 
what God is doing is he's not making one great nation and then like Israel and then condemning the rest of nations. What God is doing is he's making one great nation out of all nations. And it is his people. He calls it the church. And the church will come from all nations. The remnant comes from all nations and the remains will be defeated as the enemies of God. Now here's where we find ourselves. Every human being on earth has to establish, are they part of the remnant, the elect of God, or are they part of the remains that will be silenced when God finally says it's too late? And what we like to do, you may be in this camp, we like to say, well, I haven't made up my mind yet. Well, the Bible has a very clear picture for people who are indecisive, it calls them enemies of God. And, and we like to say, well, she's, she's, a, she's a good girl, loves her mama, Loves Jesus in America too, right? <laughs> we like to say that, but that's not a reality. Biblically and theologically, that doesn't exist. There aren't good girls. Or in Appalachian, we like to say, he's a good old boy. He's got a good heart. No, he doesn't. Unless he bows the knee to Christ, the king, he is not good. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. And if you have not bowed your life down to Jesus Christ, you're nothing short of an enemy of God. It should be a terrifying place for you to exist. Look at what this verse says about the enemies of God. In verse 17, they shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their strongholds and they shall turn in dread to the Lord our God and they shall be in fear of you. And the enemies of God will lick the dust let me take you back to the punishment of Satan himself in Genesis 3, verse 14. The Lord God says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I'm like Indiana Jones. I hate snakes. Those of you that like snakes, you're just unbiblical. That's just the way it is, right? As God said it, not me. I'm joking, you can like snakes. But the reality is, is there's a picture given in the serpent of, of on its belly with its tongue slithering out in its creepy way, licking the dust. And the Bible says that the enemies of God have the same thing coming for them. We tend to sugarcoat the reprobate, but the enemies of God are nothing short of satanic. And so if you're kind of on the fence about this Christianity thing, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to invite you to God's grace because God in his awesome goodness and grace has reached out to the people who deserve to be condemned to the dust, who deserve to be damned for eternity. And he has said, join my family. You don't need to work for it. You don't need to prove yourself. You don't even need to get rid of your own sin. I'll take care of it for you. I've sent my son to the cross to die on your behalf and I've raised him from the dead, and I promise you the same thing if you'll just turn from your sin and let me adopt you. I think Mike has taken some theological cues about the kingship of Jesus from Psalm 72, which is a song that was written before Micah's time by King Solomon. Listen to some of the lyrics of this song and look for similarities to Micah's prophecy. May he have dominion from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him and all nations serve him. That's a pretty song that Solomon wrote. And Solomon lived at a time where this almost seemingly happened. All nations were coming to Solomon. But here's Micah after Solomon's dead and gone, singing songs about a king that they're longing for and every single king that they put in office blows it. Just worse and worse and more and more evil. And what it did was it taught Israel, you should be longing for more than a king. You should be longing for a Messiah, a savior. You need not just a king, you need the king of kings. And this leads us to the answer, which is at the end of the book. The final three verses show us that our God will remain. You see, the book of Micah ends with a very powerful three verses, and they tell us three things in these three verses. Micah communicates that God forgives sin. 
So if you find yourself in a place where you're an enemy of God or you love someone dearly who's an enemy of God, don't be discouraged. God is a great forgiver of sin. The second thing in verse 19 that we see is God removes sin. And then in verse 20, he reminds us that God keeps us away from sin in a process we call sanctification. Let's go through these together as we conclude the book of Micah. Verse 18 says, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. Verse 18 begins with this phrase, who is a God like you? You know how you say that in Hebrew? Micah. Micah just sneaks his name in there. But his, his name literally translated means who is like God. Micah signs his name creatively at the, at the final doxology of his prophecy because he's asking the question, who, can, who, could you, who or what could you ever worship that is like the one true God? Or could you ever ascribe yourself to be like the one true God? Do you forgive freely like he does? Or do you require some kind of, some kind of payment or restitution to you before you forgive? Or you say, I forgive, but I don't forget. Do you let go of your anger as freely as God does, or do you hold grudges and rest in it? Do you delight in steadfast love like God does? The implied answer is that you are far short of God. Who is like him? No one. God delights in forgiveness and grace for the remnant. He passes over our transgressions and our sin. The word steadfast love that's used in verses 18 and 20 is one of my favorite words. I've got it tattooed on my wrist right here. And it's the Hebrew word hesed. It occurs over 250 times in the Old Testament. My friend Paul Bokel recently revealed to me that Sally Lloyd-Jones defines this probably better than anyone else in the English language when she writes it in the children's book that we keep over in the children's ministry rooms. The Jesus Storybook Bible defines hesed as God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. That's kind of wordy for us in English, ain't it? But the Hebrews had a word for it, hesed. It's a love that nothing could conquer. It's a love that even wrong actions wouldn't dissipate. It is a love that remains eternally. And here's what really blows my mind about what this says about this hesed that God has, this love that God has for us, is that he doesn't just have it, he delights in it. Like it's his joy to do it. Sometimes I think God just like looks down from heaven and shakes his head. He's like, I got to love Will again. He's needing some love. I'll do something nice for him. So he feels love, right? Like you, you all got people in your life like that, right? Like you love them, but it's not really a delight to love them. Like I love them, but uh, I'm kind of tired of loving them. The, the description of God is the exact opposite. He delights in loving you. He loves loving you. It's mind-blowing, and, and it truly brings us to the place that only he can forgive sin because no one, no deity has ever been like that. Even the made-up false gods are, are just purely transactional. You do something for me, I'll do something for you. That is not the God of the Bible. The message of the Bible is you have done nothing for him, yet he loves you anyway and freely forgives your sin. And not only does he forgive your sin, he removes it from your life. Look at verse 19. As if his love wasn't good enough and his forgiveness wasn't good enough, Micah goes a step further and he says he will have, a, again, compassion on us and he will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. These are some of my favorite poetic words in the Bible. You remember all that stuff about God's enemies licking the dust like a serpent? The very next verse in Genesis, God says this to Satan, the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, your, between your offspring and her offspring, that's Jesus Christ. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The very beginning of the Bible is filled with an image of the foot 
of the Messiah being bitten and bruised by Satan, but the head of the serpent being crushed by Jesus. Verse 19 tells us God will tread our iniquities, our sin, under his foot. He will squash our sins, if I could just put that in Lincoln County for you. Squirsh them. And not only is he going to squish them, but then after he squishes them, he casts them into the depths of the sea. What a beautiful picture, right? Everything that you can't seem to shake, God squashes it and throws it in the water. This past summer, we had a, we got a, uh, one of them high class memberships to Guy in a State's pool. I found out you don't even have to live there. You just go in there and swim with neighbors that aren't your neighbors. It's great. You can embarrass yourself all you want. And my kids had these little jewels, these like little diamonds and rubies and whatnot, and they sink. And they're like diving tools. And they throw them in the deep end. That, that pool's like 12 feet deep. And I forgot how deep 12 feet is. And I've, I, how do I say it? I've gotten more buoyant in my days. And so they'd throw them in. They'd be like, Dad, you're, I mean, you're half the height of the deep end. So just get down there and get them. And I'd try to swim down the bottom. I couldn't get down there. Like, I'm just floating back up. I, like, I'm the guy, I'll take a nap in the pool. I'll just float and just do it. And I realized I couldn't, I couldn't dive really 12 feet. It was really a struggle for me. And I was thinking about this as I was reading about God throwing our sin into the depths of the sea like a, like a diving toy. And I was like, how deep, how deep can humans dive? I got curious about this because in the ancient time of Micah, I'm like, they didn't have scuba gear and fins and stuff. So this, this uh, analogy would have meant probably a little more to them The depths of the sea represented for Micah in his day a place that was unapproachable by humans. And I was like, well, how far can modern humans get down? So I go on this Google search, and since I did it, y'all get to do it too. And I found this guy, Herbert Nitsch. He's an Austrian world record diver. Broke and hold his breath for nine minutes and four seconds. Like when he drives to the beach through the tunnels, he gets all the wishes. And (laughs) it's just a remarkable I watched YouTube videos on this guy. It was insane. In 04, he did a constant weight dive, which is like you can put a, you can put like a weight belt on, but whatever you have you, to get down, you got to get back up with the same weight. He did that to 367 feet deep. That's a lot deeper than Guy in a State's pool. In, in 2009, he broke three world records. He did a free immersion dive of 367. He did a constant weight dive of 404 feet. And then he did a variable weight dive of 466 feet, which is where you hold a weight, let it draw you down to the bottom, drop the weight, and swim back up to the top. 466 feet down. Dude wasn't satisfied, and neither was I in my Google search, because I saw a link that was like, for his no limit diving records, click here. And I'm like, well, I have to do that now. I'm just invested in this. I call my wife. I'm like, I'm going to be late for dinner. I'm learning about Herbert and his no limit dive, whatever that is. And so a no limit dive is where you can use propulsion to accelerate your descent and your ascent back to the top. Still no breathing apparatus, no oxygen. You just got to take a deep breath and do this. In 07, he did this no limits World record dive to 702 feet down into the water. And in 2012, he still wasn't satisfied with his own records. And he set a goal to go over 800 feet. He did that. He went to 831 feet. It's the current world record for the deepest dive. Now you know you're in the loop like me. But what happened to him on his dive in 2012 was he went down to 831 feet with one big breath into his lungs. And on his way back up, Your body's not built for that kind of pressure, not built for that depth. And on his way back up, he actually passed out. He became in a lifeless state. And his team recognized this and brought him to the surface. The rapid bringing him to the surface because he passed out led to him experiencing decompression sickness. And he lives now and the rest of his life with long-term effects from this. He suffered multiple brain strokes that day. And to this day, he's unable to walk with full balance. He just stumbles around everywhere he goes. I watched an interview with this guy. And he says he just tries to stay in water as much as he can because he feels at home in the water because he can't walk on land anymore. Dude just like ruined his, his life and his ability to walk 
just going deeper and deeper and deeper. And I was like, man, here is a good lesson for us, that there are places so deep, so dark, and so dangerous that men are not meant to go to. And this guy, in his pursuit of world records, doesn't even begin to touch the depth of the ocean at Mariana's Trench. It's 36,000 feet deep. Bro made it 800 and ruined his life. And these deep and dark and dangerous places that men are not meant to go to, those are the places that the Bible uses to describe how far away God has removed your sin from you. You can't get to it. And so if God has cast your sin to the seabed, who on earth do you think you are to try to dive deep enough to retrieve it? Yet here you are returning to the same sin that the Bible has condemned, that you've seen experientially is not good for you, and here you are putting on your flippers and putting on your weight belt, I'm going down to get it again. Give it a rest. You're going to ruin your life chasing after what God has already taken care of. God's forgiven your sin and he's removed it from you. And and the, the chapter ends in verse 20 by showing us that God will keep us away from it. Verse 20 says, you will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Again, looking way back in the past. We can be assured of God's faithfulness into the future because of his track record in the past. He looks back and he says, you have sworn faithfulness. And there's Hesed again, steadfast love. And his concluding words of Micah's prophecy is God will keep you away from harm. And the greatest threat to you and the greatest harm to you is the sin that you love. But God loves you more than you love your sin. That's the beautiful truth of the gospel. And so Jesus took all of your shame, all of your iniquity, all of your sin, all of your condemnation, placed it upon his shoulders, walked up a mountain to be crucified at Calvary. And he put it to death there. He took care of it there. And all of his goodness and all of his perfection and all of his righteousness is now transferred to the accounts of those who place their trust in him. So I don't hope in my goodness. I don't hope in my faithfulness and my ability to keep it together. I hope in God, who is greater than the depths of my sin.